Hello everyone, Dennis Chang here. I think it's the before last video of the year, and I thought I'd talk about uh, well, a, to a topic that interests me a lot. It's again, it's one of those philosophical videos. So if you don't like these kinds of videos, maybe you can watch some other video where someone shows you some lick or something. <laughs> um, by the way, there's a discount going on at DC Music School. So if you want to support me, check out DC Music School. Everything's on massive discount. Um, you can buy also if you like what you heard at the beginning. That was in Taiwan, by the way, with Duvet Dunayevsky. You can check out some of the music that we've recorded on Bandcamp and all that fun stuff. So today's video, I want to talk, it's related to what you saw earlier, about playing with intention and with purpose. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about for, for so many years, and I learned a lot about this from so many great players who, it's fun, funny how sometimes you can learn so much just by having conversations with people like over over dinner or a drink or something sometimes people get into these long philosophical rants like i'm doing right now and they say something so profound that it stays with you so one of my earliest memories of being told something really profound that affects me still today was many 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 years ago i used to play with this bass player back home in montreal not famous at all, but really, really good musician. We were just having this conversation backstage during one of our breaks or something. And he just said, you know, Dennis, we could actually spend a lifetime just working on the basics. And what he said affected me tremendously. And over the past few years, I've been focusing, become quite obsessed with founda the foundations of music, rhythm section, sound, um interpretation <clears throat> time feel like really really basic stuff because nowadays you know you, you the way music education is marketed you go on the internet or go look at magazines they want to show you all the cool skills scales the hip arpeggios uh you got to know these uh, enclosures all all those things are fine but uh what i'm going to talk about uh i think will make a huge difference in how the average audience will perceive your music Keeping in mind that most people who go listen to music might not be musicians themselves, just people who maybe like music in general without knowing the specifics of jazz. Like if they listen to Bure, they're not going to really catch on to the fact that, oh, cool, he played a B flat minor six arpeggio for A7. So playing with purpose. And just, I don't want anyone to feel targeted at all. Because the point here is not to humiliate or anything, but just to share th certain things that I've gone through over many, many years. And um, <clears throat> I've often played with people who graduated from music schools who are really, really good. Extremely, extremely talented. But they lack a certain finesse on stage in, in more ways than one. So these are people who have worked on their arpeggios they worked on their scales they worked on their legs they play they play really well on what they know how to do but on stage it almost sounds it, well <laughs> it looks like they, they just graduated from a music school and don't really know the the business of performing for an audience how to choose songs how to talk to an audience how to perform for an audience uh, and such things it's almost as if let's say i Na English is not my native tongue and I study really hard I go to English school and now I I speak perfect English but I don't sound native at all in fact I sound like a robot imagine imagine this hey would you like to go on a date with me sure that sounds fun where should we go why don't we have dinner and then go to the movies perfect English right but delivery and delivery emotion like even the the rhythm it sounds like a robot and so a lot of very talented instrumentalists okay they know how to play all the right notes all the correct notes but like you know whatever however it went all the correct notes 
correct rhythm, I think. <laughs> and but so flat. And then you know, between songs, they're like it's very awkward. Oh, what should we play next? Um, uh, oh, let's play this. Even if they have a sales, hold on, let me get my iPad. Um, this is very, very, very typical in Asia. Actually, a lot of jazz musicians rely on the iReal Pro. And then between songs, you know, like, ah, 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 looking for the song, uh, and sometimes even with uh, not with the correct changes, quote unquote correct, because actually the songs can be played in a number of different ways, and things like that. Sometimes I play with people who choose songs that they don't even know how to play, like uh, they need the chart to play the melody to the song that they chose. Now, it's not that I have anything against charts, but it's very interesting because in Asia, especially where people are very, very reliant on charts, even among professional musicians, <clears throat> there is something uh, to be said. The charts in themselves are not the problem. It's if you get used to only using charts and it affects the way you play on stage, that is the problem. For me, for example, I've really developed a lot of the basic skills of music and I'm very, very familiar with harmony. So if I have to use a chart, it's because there's a song I've never played before. I don't even know what it sounds like. I'll need the chart. But when I, and depending on how complicated the song is, if it's just a standard A, B, A form or whatever, A, B, A, C, usually I look at it once and I've, I'll have it memorized it. Um, but let's say I'm I myself am reading a chart. I have the skills to be able to read a chart and not let it affect how I play on stage. Meaning that uh, I barely look at the chords and I'm able to look at the chords like I understand harmony so well that I can see where the chords I can kind of guess where the chords are going. So when I look at it, I'm kind of looking at it with maybe 20% concentration looking at the chart 80% is listening to what's going around me and I've noticed again playing with these a lot of people um, who are relying on charts it's it is a they're 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 focusing they're putting all their attention on the chart and it affects the what's going on around them they're not noticing certain musical cues the tempo fluctuations dynamics and everything so everything is always flat and that's personally what I'm against and quite honestly <clears throat> It is weird for me when people choose songs that they want to play, but they don't know it. So they need the chart. So that, that's something else. So that, and then playing with intention, you know, being very deliberate about where you place the notes rhythmically, how you deliver the notes, just like a speech. And, and it, all, all these things depend on so many different factors. It happens, you have to be aware, very, very present here and listen and what's going around. And then in the moment, react accordingly. And it's the same thing when you're, let's say you're talking to someone, let's say you're in a library, you're gonna go, hey, how are you doing? No, it makes no sense to be in a library to speak that way. You go, hey, how's it going, man? You know, speak quietly. Or if you're somewhere noisy, okay, then maybe can you raise your voice? It all depends, there are so many scenarios and you have to read the room. And so it is with music, you have to read the room as well. So let's talk about the guitar here. This is an acoustic guitar, but even on the electric guitar, one thing <clears throat> is now we tend to be over reliant on technology and again that is going to affect how we perform uh, technology is a great thing but I, in my opinion anyway we should not let it affect how we perform we should be very conscious about such things so i don't know some time ago some weeks ago I played on an electric guitar, a borrowed electric guitar, and someone noticed something peculiar about technique, about my technique when I played that guitar that I didn't even notice. They said, oh wow, I noticed you're picking like around here instead of here on that electric guitar. Why is that? Is that how you always pick? Actually, no. I didn't even realize I was doing that. But what it is, is when I grab a guitar, whatever guitar it is, and I plug it into the amp, electric guitar, I start playing. And because I've gotten so used to really thinking about sound and delivery, my hands started to, to gravitate towards this spot where I felt this, it sounded best. So my hand might, might have been around here and I was playing around here and someone picked up on that. But, but now it's, it's, 
it, for me it's deliberate but it, it's subconscious because it's something that I've been doing for so long and that's what I mean so if I'm playing this guitar you know I, I, I play my, my, my hands will gradually move around until it finds ah. if I play pluck harder doesn't sound good but softer here ah I can hit harder listen train your ears to listen and then you have to hear also it depends on the room that you're in in a room like this it's a closed space so there's reflection so it affects my technique it affects the sound it affects the way i hold my pick everything so the other day you know i played a, a gig with my friend and he, he's a good player and actually he's, he has a nice sound but in that room he was playing with the, the way he always played anywhere else but in that room it just it didn't he, the way he usually played did not work and i told him you have to really dig in more instead of a if this is a tiny space here if we're just two people and we have to play quietly if we play like this it's fine but if we're playing in a, a bigger room with an audience slightly noisy but people are still attentive you cannot play this way no one will hear you especially for acoustic and that's kind of a lost art the ability to not rely too much on technology to use our, our hands and I notice this a lot nowadays when I go to uh, bebop jam sessions drummers play so loud because people are using amps and everything and they get used to playing loud that's their normal mode but for me when I play I am listening to what's going on. what's the volume the general volume of the other musicians ah if everyone is kind of soft then I'm gonna roll down the volume knob or just change the amp setting so the volume is a little bit lower uh, softer I, I listen and it's something that a lot of people are not doing these days so what you saw at the beginning that was uh, the Taipei Gypsy Jazz Festival Duved notice that we're playing without any amplification whatsoever it's a 300 seat or 350 seat concert hall and you just have the overhead mics on top and we don't we don't even have to sound check and also if you watch the video of us at Samoa the sound check our sound check was really really fast because with this band these are people who are very conscious of such things we sit in a very specific configuration where we don't need much monitoring at all notice the way we are sitting it's very strategic uh, it's optimized for so that the band can hear each other in you know in an optimal way but also so that it projects in an optimal way as well so these are things that I suggest you work on, like learning to sit close together, placing the instruments in strategic uh, places, having strategic line of sight so you can communicate visually, all sorts of things like that. So there we go. Let's say you're doing, playing a concert. What kind of concert it is? What is your idea of this concert? Is it background music? Okay, if it's background music, no one's listening. This is a great opportunity to practice all these tough songs that you feel like shedding, you know, giant steps, stable mates, whatever, no problem. But are you playing for a listening audience? Who is in the listening audience? Let's say I played an old folks home. I don't think they really care about Spain, about the song Spain by Chick Corea, you know, stable mates, uh, Bolivia. Great songs, really. But I think they depending on the country too especially in america they might relate to songs like uh, there will never be another you autumn leaves you know choosing the repertoire for the audience <clears throat> now if you're playing for other music nerds okay feel free and do all your music nerd stuff to be very aware of the situation reading the room and it's how i play my concerts these days you know listen i'm not Birel Legrand. uh but I know how to play for an audience and it always works. I've played, um, every time I play a concert, I, I look who's, 
who's in the room who's watching me most of the time they're not musicians or like maybe amateur level musicians but they like jazz they like gypsy jazz or whatever i choose the songs accordingly and i waste no time between songs like you know we finish a song uh what's next one uh, and i take charge i'm very much in the moment i'm very it's not that i what i do everything i do is correct but someone has to be confident on stage if, if, so if you're not sure how to end the song someone has to take the lead you know like uh, That makes it very clear that it's the ending. A lot of times with these kind of music school graduates, okay, we're doing you know the 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 repeated cycle. Over and over, and everyone's like, huh, 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 huh. And then after someone, you know, like uh without even giving a signal, someone does an ending phrase, but no one catches it and it just Someone has to be confident. Someone has to take charge. And you have to be in the moment, aware, listen. And if you're so focused on the chart, you cannot do that, right? That's exactly what happened not so long ago. The song was over, but one of the musicians just kept playing. And like, oh, it's over? That does not bode well. <laughs> the number of choruses you take, the order of the, the soloists, I vary things up. Sometimes I play the melody. Sometimes the other person plays the melody. Uh, if I play the melody, maybe I take the first solo. And then say the second song, I play the melody again, I'll give the solo to someone else first. Maybe even give it to the bass player first. Things like that, switch it up. And I try to say what I have to say uh, within maybe two, three courses. It depends how inspired I feel. If I'm really inspired and I feel like I'm in the zone, it doesn't happen often. I might take a f you know more choruses, the pacing, and let's say you have like five, four soloists on stage. Not everyone has to play a solo on every single song, because you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to play? Is it a jam session on stage? Okay, a jam session on stage, sure. But like, but that can be very very boring for the audience. But I think about the length of the song, uh, the distribution of solos. Like let's say. Um, it's a ballad, then maybe I take half a chorus. The other person takes half a chorus. And then instead of playing the whole melody again, we take it from the the, 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 the middle part, the B part. Sometimes it's not necessary to play the melody twice. Maybe you play the melody beginning, then you start training, you build the intensity, then you end the song. There are lots of things like that. And that's why I really love playing with uh, Duved and the people that we play with because it's it's everything is so deliberate and it's it's just a tremendous joy to play with him and the other musicians that we play with these days i'm personally more concerned with how the entire band is playing rather than just me as a soloist it's the whole experience think about it a person like birelli or whoever is the best music soloist in the world can only be as good as the weakest link so if birelli is paired with a really really bad rhythm section Birelli will not be at his best and so it is very important for the rhythm section to be on top of their game and then the rhythm section there are so many things like aesthetic choices to make what style you're going for what what are you trying to convey really understanding the harmony which not a lot of people do unfortunately when I say understand the harmony I'm not saying oh this is a one six two five one no it's like to understand the idiom what what are you trying to go so it's funny we uh did this gig with Duved not too long ago and uh, Duved of course is playing music in the, of the 30s in that aesthetic and after we opened up a jam session and all this person and I, and I don't blame this person because this person is a product of the music school system calls all the modern jazz songs that have nothing to do with 30s because this person doesn't even know what the difference is between standards written in the 30s versus standards written in the 40s 50s 60s and onward and that's how it is because when you go to music school jazz is just one very 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 general umbrella term so a song like uh, all of me is put in the same category as a song like bolivia it's just a jazz standard uh, maybe, maybe they might 
you know, differentiate, all right, post bop, bebop, but that still doesn't tell you much. Now, there are songs written in the 40s and 50s that evoked the style of the 30s. Such things do exist. Like a song like L-O-V-E. That could have been a song written in the 30s, but it's actually a song from the 60s. But no way, uh, be <laughs> very, very rare to hear a song like uh, Stable Mates in the 1920s. It's harmony, the way music evolved, they didn't even think that far at that time. This is just not music of the 30s. And so <laughs> that musician would want to jam, <laughs> do that says, that's not what we do, that's not what we do. Every single kept naming one song after the other that had absolutely nothing with the style, and it's the same thing with with the blues. You go to music school, it's, chances are it's going to be played something like this, you know, if in B flat. Something like that, you know. Rhythm changes. This is the music school way of playing the blues and the rhythm changes. But actually, historically, the blues and rhythm changes uh, are deeper than that. They're different harmonies to, to convey different um, aesthetics, to understand an idiom, which is rarely, rarely taught in music schools. Uh, and it's a shame. It's as if, you know, if we take the example of classical music, let's say I'm organizing a festival of baroque music and then i ask the conductor who doesn't know anything about this all right what should we play well i was thinking we should do some mendelssohn some beethoven some wagner that has nothing to do with baroque music so that's kind of the problem with the modern jazz education it puts everything in one category jazz but there's 1930s way of playing jazz 1920s and even within the 1930s the early 1930s the late 1930s and depending on the the region you know the kansas city style uh, the way they were doing in Europe, the way they might have been doing in New York, etc., etc., depending on the musician, you know. <clears throat> if you listen to um, Lester Young with Count Basie, it doesn't sound exactly the same as uh, what Benny Goodman was doing. The bass lines, the drum style, the way the guitar player is comping, etc. Lots of things there. And these are things that you have to learn by being conscious of such things things and to listen to the music very very attentively listen to every single part and try to understand why it's played the way it's played read the room read you know your the environment my technique does change in very minuscule ways depending on where i am i might play louder i might play softer i might pick here there depending on the gear there are so many factors and to and so for that this is actually a different kind of ear training it's listening to to music in such a way like ah this is how i think it should sound it's almost like being a good conductor a good conductor has a musical vision they hear what the music should sound like again if you're if you're a beginner or everything don't mind what it is just focus on getting the basics but like if you start playing gigs and maybe you even went to music school this, this yeah this is kind of an advanced topic it's for people who maybe went to music school they're young and they started playing gigs but have not really been involved in like the the next level of of a musician's career of, of a performing musician's career there was a time when i used to do that where i used to tour around uh canada and the usa and sometimes in europe we're play we're not playing bar gigs we're playing actual concert halls Play, that paid really good money and I had to learn how to entertain an audience and I learned a lot from that experience and uh, David Reinhardt in his DC music school lessons also talks about something like that he saw he says uh, that when he was younger he, he his career started earlier very early for better or for worse but it taught him a lot of very important lessons that you don't really learn elsewhere unless you do that job so there we go that's food for thought um, 
Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, or whatever it is that you celebrate or don't celebrate. Uh, be happy. And uh, again, if you want to support me, you know, DC Music School, Bandcamp, Sound Slides, buy my books. Hey!